Hello, I'm Pip Courtney. I'm the host of the ABC's Landline Program Rural Current Affairs Show, which turned 30 last year. I've reported all over rural, regional and remote Australia for Landline for nearly 29 years. And if there's one story I do not want to cover ever, it's foot and mouth disease. It's a rural reporter's key dread. The second one is reporting on lumpy skin disease. Now, organisers of this webinar have chosen four experts to cover off on what you all need to know to keep your animals and your industry safe and your communities strong. All four are a reporter's dream. They're great communicators, they're knowledgeable, they're articulate, and they can talk in clear English. Now, first up, we have the first assistant, Secretary, Biosecurity Animal Division, National Animal Disease Preparedness Coordinator at the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Dr. Chris Parker. I don't know how you get all that on your card, Chris. And your CV is very impressive. Chris studied as a vet and worked for a number of years in mixed practice in rural WA and South Australia, moved to Melbourne briefly to take up a role as technical services manager with a large ag and veterinary chemical company. Then he moved back to South Australia to manage and operate a large family farming and grazing property. And then his family moved to Canberra to take a role as a senior political advisor for the ag minister in the Howard government. In 2006, he took up a position in DAF where he has held a number of roles with biosecurity service delivery and broader departmental policy. He spent 2011 and to 2015 in Washington DC as the Minister Councillor for Ag at the Australian Embassy. And in 2017, Chris was appointed CEO of the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority and is currently working as that very long title I mentioned before. Chris, you have 10 minutes and he owes me a bottle of bubbles if he goes over time, everyone. Thank you, Pip. Um, I appreciate that introduction. And, and uh, the simplest way of fitting on a card is not to have a card. So uh, that's the way it works for me. But uh, yes, it is a long title. But I think essentially what we might talk about tonight is uh, the history of uh, a little bit of the spread of these two diseases. And then we might talk about, um, I think, uh, the response from the Australian government and how we're looking to uh, keep these diseases out and also prepare for uh, any possibility of them entering the country. So if we look at when we first started to become concerned about these diseases as they started to spread through Asia, and certainly by March when lumpy skin disease was detected in Indonesia, um, we started to become really, uh, I think, quite alert to uh, the prospect of these diseases. This was further exacerbated, I suppose, when, uh, when foot and mouth disease was diagnosed in Indonesia in May. So we had March LSD, May foot and mouth disease. And then in July, foot and mouth disease was, um, was confirmed in the island of Bali. Now, the reason that we'd be concerned about Bali, I think, as most people on, uh, on the webinar would know, is that there is a large um, uh, a movement of people, particularly tourists, between Bali and Australia. Um, a lot of them um, are spending quite short periods of time in Bali and then coming back and going straight back to work. So really, from our perspective, the threat assessment of those, or if you like, the risk of those two diseases changes quite significantly as they move closer. Um, and uh, also the risk where you have a active outbreak where you'll see uh, uh, large amounts of virus in both the population of susceptible animals, but also within the environment um, is also of concern. And then when you've got the movement of people and goods between those two countries, that's also of a concern. So that increased risk. So really what we look at is a three pronged approach and the three pronged approach is about a pre-border response, a border response, and then a post-border response. The pre-border response is all about doing work in Indonesia to assist them to manage particularly foot and mouth disease. That's their focus. Their focus is around food security. And it's worth just reflecting just briefly on the differences for us with this disease. So in Indonesia, the issue is food security. So they're not gonna go through a wholesale slaughter campaign to get rid of this disease. For us, our interest is this is a disease of trade. If we get it, it shuts markets, and that's a real issue for us, whereas food security is not quite as important to us because we are obviously a very food secure nation. So just that prism means that they manage it in a slightly different way, and we shouldn't necessarily be 
are overly critical of the manner in which they're doing it, where they've got a very strong focus on vaccination. We've got a very strong focus on supporting them in that, and we've provided um, a million doses of vaccine. We're about to provide another three million doses of vaccine, all of which contributes to them being able to manage the situation as they go forward. They are focused on controlling it in Bali for two reasons. The first is that they are host of G20 this year, so that and G20 is going to be on Bali. So they would like the disease situation to be under control with world leaders visiting and being able to showcase the island. They also recognise its significant tourist um, destination and they also want it clean for that way. So we've been working very closely with them around vaccine. We've been working very closely with them about providing technical support for uh, managing the epidemiology around this disease and managing uh, certainly some of the issues around how they might uh, put vaccine into the field and also providing assistance in training of uh, those doing vaccine, um, those distributing the vaccine. Um, they have vaccinated over, uh, over 2 million uh, animals at the moment. Um, and what we've seen since June, where we saw a peak of infections, we've now seen a plateau of infections and even a little bit uh, are declining. There's also been a number of places where uh, the disease was, provinces uh, where the disease was, where uh, they haven't seen any active cases for up to a week. So all of those are positive signs that it's being controlled in Indonesia. We then have the work we're doing at the border and the government significantly upgraded resources at the border, uh, including sanitation mats, including biosecurity risk zones, all those sorts of things to ensure that we're managing the risk of both passengers but more importantly, the products they might be bringing into the country where, which uh, are FMD susceptible products or, or products that can carry FMD, should I say. Um, all of that work uh, has involved a significant uplift at the border, both in personnel and investment in time and effort. Um, and we are finding, particularly for those flights from Indonesia, um, we're seeing very high compliance rates uh, amongst those folk who are, uh, are coming in uh, from, from Indonesia. I might remind you, a vast majority of them are Australian citizens, um, and we've been spending a lot of time with uh, education, both as they leave the country, as the in country, and then as they're coming back in, plus all, all the uh, all, all the fines that uh, are, are in place to manage anything uh, that they might bring in, plus all the inspections, the dogs, all those sorts of things are really important um, as part of that. Then, of course, we've got a post-border response. And by that, I mean, what are we doing in the marketplace? And in the marketplace, there's two things we're doing. The first thing we're doing is we're testing any products that we, we seize at the border to see whether they may be carrying FMD. Um, and we found one of those cases where uh, there was. That's all treated under a biosecure manner and there's no great drama with that. We've also been doing some testing of product um, on supermarket shelves. Um, obviously, we trade with nations, some of which have foot and mouth disease, but we have uh, measures in place to ensure any of those products would be safe. So, for example, you might have a, uh, a, a meat product that is, uh, that is canned and retorted, so it's heat treated, so it kills the virus. Um, but part of our uh, assurance mechanisms to ensure that food or cargo coming into the country, we do that testing to make sure that we're in a position to be able to go, those measures are working at the border. We're not seeing what is of concern um, there uh, at the border. So really those three responses are a key component of the way that we are keeping the disease out but also preparing. And then finally, there's a whole lot of work that's gone into preparation. One of the really important things that I think the government's done is um, it's been able to, uh, for the first time, and this is probably because we have a Minister uh, for Agriculture, Federal Minister for Agriculture, who's also the Minister for Emergency Management. Um, and I think what that's done is been able to link those two really key components. And uh, a, a task force was uh, recently reported uh, uh, went for four weeks, did a whole lot of investigation into the system and then reported to the minister. And I think what we found really importantly is for the first time in my involvement with agriculture, and I think I've been involved probably even longer than Pip has um, as far as engagement with agriculture goes. Um, for the first time, certainly, uh, I think we've seen one of the great connections between industry and state government and federal government. Um, and what we're now seeing is that broader linkage into those emergency management personnel we may need if we're able to face a horrible disease situation like this. And that's the first time I think I've seen those really strong linkages going into the police force, in emergency services, into a whole range of personnel, including military. The military actually now 
doing preparatory work around this space where they weren't before. Um, and I think what we're seeing now is that where we do need to put measures in place, if something was to happen, we now have a very clear understanding across government and emergency services about how that may be implemented to assist what I call the biological response. So the response of vets going and, and uh, testing animals and treating animals or, or unfortunately maybe euthanizing animals, those sorts of things. And also assisting in stock standstills, all those sorts of uh, uh, issues where really we as, as maybe I suppose veterinarians and that side of things are not as equipped as well as uh, some of our emergency services folk are. So Pip, I might leave it there, I think, and let other folk talk about their components. Um, I trust that was under the tin. I didn't time myself. I hope I don't owe you a bottle of champagne and you seemed a bit reticent about providing me with a bottle if I was under 10 minutes. So uh, we might leave it to others, but thank you for the opportunity to speak and, uh, and lovely to meet folk, even if it's virtually and look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Chris Parker. Um, and yeah, sorry, I didn't time it. So you got off lightly. I was warned that you might go a little bit over. And thanks for that federal government perspective, because up next with the state government perspective is Dr. Eliz Braddon, and she's the Manager of Animal Biosecurity Preparedness and Response at the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. She also has a very impressive uh, CV. Um, Eliz became a district vet in the young area in 2003. And during her time as a district vet, she worked on an equine influenza outbreak both at a control centre level as well as local producer level in the red zone near Young. She also experienced firsthand the impact of avian influenza on district poultry farms in 2013. These experiences led her to her current role as the manager of animal biosecurity preparedness and response with the New South Wales DPI. Under her guidance, the DPI team is working on ensuring that New South Wales preparedness plans are well considered across the spectrum of alignment to the national strategy, aligned to New South Wales legislation and can be operationalised so that New South Wales can get the best outcome possible for the ag sector and communities in New South Wales. Dr. Liz Braddon, your, your time starts now. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, like Chris, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you this evening um, and just let you know a little bit about sort of how this all works in terms of a response at the state level. And this is pretty applicable across any of the jurisdictions or territories, so states and territories. Um, but uh, as you can still see, uh, I'll try and outline how that actually works. So the first thing to understand, I guess, is that emergency animal diseases are defined um, they're a pretty specific list and they're specific to diseases that have significant impacts on livestock. Uh, and that can include the potential for increased livestock deaths, but also things like production losses. It also has the uh, ability, we, we have diseases that impact on human health um, and potentially the environment. So they're all, they're defined by international and national um, levels as to their importance and their impact um, on a world stage, as well as to us here in Australia, if we don't have them. And the long-term effect, of course, is not only is it the individual producers who are impacted if it happens to them specifically, or they're impacted by the control measures, but we know that it has a flow on effect um, that goes to the local region if it's a small enough one, but in this case with foot and mouth or some of the bigger ones that are threatening our shores, um, you know, the impact will be, as Chris said, a, a national one. Um, and that's the aim of the game is to try and minimise that impact. We have a unique opportunity in Australia. We have an agreement called the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement um, that is quite special in that it is a formally agreed decision-making tool, if you like, and it, it provides certainty for our management of emergency responses right from day one. So right now, if we were unfortunate enough to have a disease outbreak that was one of our emergency animal diseases, the states and territories and the impacted industries already know that we can just go ahead and start the response and implement our plans uh, because the cost sharing, the, the financial backing and all of those processes and frameworks are pre-arranged. Um, and that's very, um, provides a huge amount of certainty in terms of how Australia in the animal world can respond. So what actually happens? So if someone happens to uh, 
see something unusual. So this could be a producer, uh, could be a private vet, could be a district vet, could be a truck driver, anyone involved in the industry basically um, has an obligation. So if they report that, um, there's an investigation that causes enough concern uh, through the disease space, then normally what happens is it will make its way through the chain to the chief veterinary officer of the state. Um, so for us, that's Sarah Britton here in New South Wales. Um, and if it's really significant enough and there's concerns that there's clinical signs, multiple animals, history is all matching and looking quite um, concerning, then she will actually inform the Australian chief veterinary officer at that level. And from there, that is what triggers the sort of uh, framework and that, that joint action plan, if you like, of the states and territories, both at the veterinary level um, in the first instance, but also industry representatives are on all of those levels of both the technical review of the proposed response, depending on the scenario. Um, and then that the formal agreement to the national management group, which is where you know the, the, the formal stuff happens basically in terms of kicking off uh, the agreement and the, the general strategic plan is endorsed. What is happening on the ground though, however, is you've, you've also got simultaneously um, this, New South Wales would be implementing uh, tracing and history gathering on the property in question. Um, even at a level of suspicion, we will already be implementing that at the disease investigation level, just to cover the bases. So we do this routinely and Scott will, will uh, tell you a bit more about what happens at the district vet level. Um, but this is done all the time um, for, for small and, and minor and anything that looks risky. Basically, that's part of our surveillance program that is occurring at the same time as well. And that's you know, the, the backed up by our emergency animal disease hotline, which hopefully you've all got plugged into your phones, which Scott's probably going to give it a plug, but I will too. So please add 1-800-675-888 to your phones. Um, because if you get a situation where you're just not sure what's happening, we would much prefer that you put in a call um, either to that hotline number, which is MAN 24-7, or in fact to, to a district vet or a private vet, if that's your preference, um, just to ask the questions, because it's better to ask the question um, and get it investigated than to leave yourself wondering. So the surveillance is ongoing as well. That, that occurs through the infected property. There may be ongoing surveillance on that. There may be in, investigations on the neighboring properties. The tracing may identify animal movements that would then require us to go and have a look at those properties and the movement restrictions are happening at the same time. So that top layer of surveillance tracing and movement restrictions, um, that's all implemented once we've got confirmation and potentially even at a high level of suspicion at the state level. The further bottom line, the vaccination, decontamination, and yes, unfortunately, destruction and disposal, depending on the disease response strategy, um, those things come, but they come within days. So they're not instantaneously happening, um, but they certainly will follow in quick succession, uh, depending again on the disease response. So for OSBET plan for the foot and mouth disease response policy, that's, um, so all of these diseases are publicly available, response plans, sorry, not the diseases <laughs> themselves, the strategies that Australia will implement for them are all publicly available on the Animal Health Australia website, if you wanna go and have a look yourself later on. Um, but, and we call them Ausbet plan just to signify the Australian veterinary plan. Um, so FMD is currently being reviewed to update it to the most recent known global situation. Um, it's got a full front end to end response review um, considering the, the learnings of others. But our principal strategy in Australia, as Chris mentioned, is to try and eradicate it as quickly as possible um, with the intention of ideally without vaccination so that we can get returned to our trade situations and minimize the impact on the on the industry, both at a local level, but all the way through the chain uh, to the Australian end. And the, the principles around this stuff is the same, regardless of the disease in most cases. And that's about preventing exposure. So your movement restrictions, um, you know, uh, putting limits on where things and the high risk products are moving is, is what's involved in that preventing exposure. Um, that may also involve your vaccination, depending on the disease. And then, of course, the, the destruction and disposal component is about decreasing the virus load in those animals, because any animal that's infected with these diseases is often a high uh, shedder of virus. So most of us now have a better understanding of that from COVID, and it's no one's fault, but um, that's just the nature of viruses in particular. So the challenge with lumpy skin disease, it again is another OSVET plan that we have, and it's a, 
also been reviewed and recently published in its most current form, is it's vector borne. So the challenge with that one is a little bit more complex than foot and mouth disease, simply because we have a, a, an unknown, un, sorry, not an unknown, but an unquantifiable or uncontrollable vector species that's moving around with this one. So we're more likely to prefer to use vaccination in this case, um, simply because it will allow us to control that, uh, you know, spread impact of where we, where we can control it with movement of animals specifically. In a vector disease, you actually have to come at it a little bit differently in terms of managing how do you how do you create that buffer of of um, immune animals if you've got insects that are flying about so you've got to try and get in front of them so it's a slightly different response strategy but the principles are certainly very much the same just a bit more about quarantine and oh the old quarantine that everybody sort of thinks about um, and the movement controls more preferably. So the idea is, again, as we said, to try and minimize that spread um, and reduce the exposure to susceptible species. So if you're one of the, you might be the infected property, which is your initiating one. There could be multiple infected properties as time goes on in the initial parts of a response. Um, but you can also then be a trace or a suspect property is one that actually may not have any linkages at all to an infected property, but it has susceptible animals and they are showing clinical signs that are consistent with that disease. They may also be directly linked, but in most cases, that's the difference between a trace property. They may, they most likely don't have clinical disease showing, but they've had a linkage through a movement to an infected property, whereas suspect properties very specifically are designated because they are showing clinical signs. So they're a bit more of a higher priority to make sure that we manage those first because of the risk that they might become infected on, on further testing. The, the sidelines, the black text of, of ARPs and PORs don't get caught up in um, the, the language and the acronyms because I know we're very bad at, at uh, putting it all out there, but essentially those are the properties that have no known connection at this point in time um, to an, an infected property. So they're just the farms that are sitting in those locations um, and they're captured up and they are impacted by the fact that they're either within the restricted area or within the control area. Um, simply because the point of the restricted area is that's the known infected zone, if you like. Um, and so we try and put quite tight restrictions in there so that we're actually minimizing the risk of animals moving in and out that might be infected. So it's trying to capture that and contain that spread concern. And the control area then is essentially that defined area around which we use to create the buffer. So we don't believe there's infection in the control area when we put it in place. Um, and they do vary over time, but essentially that acts as your buffer. Um, and then you've got the rest of the area, which, which would be the outside area. Um, uh, but the main thing, I guess, in an instant of foot and mouth disease and, and possibly lumpy skin as well, on the first day of, of a confirmation, it is likely those, that control area will be defined by the state border. Um, it, so it will impact on everyone in New South Wales initially until we get a bit more of an understanding of actually what's happening um, with the disease and, and how far it's actually potentially spread. So um, sadly, everyone gets uh, some skin in the game on this one simply because we will their movement restrictions will impact on everyone initially. And then over time, as we learn more about the response, um, that they shrink so that we can get ourselves back into uh, a proof of freedom phase where we can start trading again and, and uh, proving that we're still clean and green. We just had a bit of a blip. So what's New South Wales been doing specifically? Um, in fact, New South Wales and most other jurisdictions have been preparing for a foot and mouth disease response for the last 20 years. Um, when the UK got hit in 2001, most states and jurisdictions in Australia started to look at what would we do here in Australia? So 2001 versus 2022, uh, there's a long time. There's lots of learnings that have happened. The UK, unfortunately, had another outbreak um, in 2011. Uh, however, they had a vast improvement. So we can learn from what, those, what other countries have done. Japan has also had an outbreak. And that's why we have continual renewal of our processes. So we've already got an initial emergency animal disease response plan. So that document that goes up to those decision-making bodies at the state and uh, industry levels to kick it off. Um, that document is already prepared for New South Wales. What needs to be added is the context of the, the situation at the hand. But in terms of 
what things we'll implement in terms of surveillance strategies, tracing processes, um, you know, how we will manage the livestock uh, destruction and containment issues, that's all captured in that document. And it is set up as uh, a framework. So again, every state and territory has similar things in their response plans, and that's why they can all be aligned at that national level if need be. The other thing that underpins that emergency animal disease response plan and the agreements behind it is having your legal ordinance instruments in place. So again, New South Wales already has these pre-prepared. They will need contextualizing to the event if it happens, um, but essentially the bones of what's required is already in them um, so that we're not having to try and scramble and develop a, a fairly comprehensive legal document um, just as something happens. So they're pre-prepared. We've also been working police with police and transport New South Wales um, and a lot of the other agencies. So the, the folks that we help out in, in droughts and floods, um, they're now looking at how they can help us out as Chris said. So uh, we're working with all of them in terms of how would we implement operationally at the ground level, a national livestock standstill to, to you know, make that as smooth as possible in, in that situation. Similarly with the destruction and disposal, there's. There's obviously a huge challenge in that space and we want to make sure that we don't end up with an environmental issue at the end of it if we can avoid it. So we're working quite closely and have been for a number of years now with the environmental protection agencies to figure out what's the best way um, to manage a very bad situation. Fundamental to all of this is making sure that we've actually got response messages, both um, you know, what can we do now to raise awareness and things like this webinar and, and everyone coming along is much appreciated because it helps spread the word of where we're at. Um, but similarly, we've also got messages that we know we'll need for the, the minute that someone has a confirmed infection, whether that's in New South Wales or another jurisdiction. So that's already prepared and we're looking to share those now across jurisdictions so that everybody can see whether we're aligned because as we've all learned with COVID, we need to have a consistent message so that we're not actually confusing each other. Um, if it's, you know, if you live close to a border, for example, you wanna make sure you're getting the same message from both sides of the border, ideally, rather than, than uh, getting a potentially conflicting message. And the other thing we've been constantly doing is exercising and testing these scenarios, both with industry partners, um, but also the other jurisdictions to, uh, particularly where we've got normal, um, known movements of livestock. So in our case in New South Wales, we move a lot of stock between Queensland and Victoria and us um, in particular. So we know that we've got issues there uh, that we need to manage and make sure that we can do that as smoothly as possible without having a, a big impact if we can avoid it where there's, where there's minimal risk. And I'm sure as Scott will talk about a bit more, we are always on the lookout from a surveillance perspective. Um, you know, we spend time in sale yards, we do on-farm surveillance with private vets and, and district vets in New South Wales. And we are in contact with the abattoirs and the other industries as well, just to, to make sure everybody's got their eyes out and, and having a look, because that's the best way that we could actually get on top of these things early and make sure that we've got the best opportunity to eradicate is uh, everybody having a good look at what's going on on their farm and raising the flag if it looks a bit odd. That's it for me, Pip. Thank you, Dr. Braddon. Now we're going to our third vet for the night, which is Dr. Scott Ison, the local land services state vet. There's my cat just causing some drama. Okay, sorry about that. Aww. Dr. Scott, I'm sorry about uh, my badly behaved cat, but as you as a vet know, there's not much you can do about that. So would you like to um, have your 10 minutes? Thanks, Pip. Um, so, this evening, I just wanted to um, talk to everyone about what you can do on your farm with the um, in regards to our foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease prevention and preparedness. So this is the what are the practical steps that you can do right now on your property. Um, so the first thing we want everyone to do is know the signs of foot and mouth disease um, and know what to do when when you when you see when you suspect. Um, foot and mouth disease or lumpy skin disease on your property. So it's really important that everyone working with livestock knows the signs and knows what to do if they suspect the diseases. Um, FMD can infect uh, all cloven hooved animals, including cattle, sheep, pigs, goats, alpaca and deer. And the key signs are lameness, blisters, erosions, drooling and production losses. 
Similarly with lumpy skin disease, um, it only affects cattle and buffalo and the skin lesions are the key sign with lumpy skin disease. Only about 50% of infected cattle can show signs in some situations, um, but you will also notice uh, production losses, fever, um, the cattle can, can get quite thick. So what do you do if you suspect one of these diseases or any anim emergency animal disease? Um, reporting immediately is key to diagnosing and containing early cases. Um, you might find it easiest to call your district veterinarian directly rather than the 1800 number. So if you've got those details for your local district veterinarian, you can call them directly and have a chat to them. Um, I've got a QR code uh, on the page there now. That takes you to a website with a list of all of our district veterinarians across New South Wales with their location, their phone number. So you can get in, get in contact and get to know your local district vet. Um, if you can't get a hold of your district vet, um, and sometimes they could be they could be out uh, doing specific work, doing a, a disease investigation. Um, there is always the emergency animal disease hotline, which Liz alluded to before. Uh, so that number is 1800 675 It's a 24 hour service, and that will get you through to a government veterinarian seven days a week. Um, someone will triage your call and a field vet will respond as necessary. Um, Remember, if you can't, if you suspect an emergency animal disease and you can't get your district vet or a private vet, you have to call the emergency animal disease hotline immediately. Next, I just wanted to talk about registrations and record keeping. So I think we've all got a pretty good understanding with biosecurity through COVID about the importance of tracing and understanding where a disease might have come from to infect someone um, and who else they might have infected, etc. So there are two key pieces of information here annual land and stock returns. Um, anyone who's a, a local land services customer, anyone who has livestock in New South Wales has to complete their annual land and stock return before the 31st of August each year. So we've just gone past that deadline. If you didn't get your annual land and stock return in, you can still contact your local office or go on the website and submit your annual land and stock return. And the other key thing is um, being compliant with the National Livestock Identification System requirements. NLIS. So there's a few key steps here for anyone that's got livestock, uh, identifiable livestock, for any sort of livestock, you need to have a PIC, a property identification code. You can get that from your local land services office. Um, if you've got cattle, sheep, goats, or pigs, uh, sorry, cattle, sheep, or goats, you need to become LPA accredited as well to be able to sell those. Um, you can order an NVD book then. There are a few other steps there. Um, if you get in contact with your local land services office, they can help you through um, all of those steps listed there to make sure you're compliant. And the key thing is anytime you move livestock onto your property, you need to update the NLAS database. Um, you can also perform a pick reconciliation for cattle. So to make sure um, any cattle that are currently on your property are listed on your property and you haven't got any extra cattle um, listed on your property that aren't there. A bit like a stock take, I suppose. Next thing I wanted to talk about is stool feeding, which we call prohibited pig feed. So that's uh, meat or meat products or any imported milk products, any, any feeds that have been contaminated by those types of products, been in contact with those types of products. So um, stool feeding or pro prohibited fig, pig feed is the most likely entry point for foot and mouth disease into Australia. Um, and the key is that if illegally imported uh, meat or milk products come into Australia and are consumed by pigs, um, that's, a, that's the most likely way that we could get foot and mouth disease in, into Australia. Um, kitchen scraps are okay if they haven't been in contact with with soil, with prohibited pig feed. But if it's been in contact, you can't feed it to your pigs. And another um, potential source of soil feeding is feral pigs. So it's important that you fence, fence rubbish tips and make sure you're um, in control of feral pigs and your, um, and your rubbish tips. And Mick will talk more about uh, feral pigs later on. Lumpy skin disease. Um, lumpy skin disease is a key transmission point is insect vectors. So if you're looking at um, protecting your cattle from lumpy skin disease, 
You can look into controlling biting flies, mosquitoes and ticks as well can play a role. Um, integrated mosquito management is key. And um, there are a few good resources out there that talk about integrated mosquito management. And it's about the three stages, monitoring larvae and adults, managing the environment and chemical control. Um, you can also quarantine, introduce cattle just to check that they don't show any signs of lumpy skin disease or, or other diseases. Um, a key thing that you can do on your property is farm biosecurity planning. So a lot of people will have done a farm, farm biosecurity plan with LPA accreditation that became mandatory in 2017. Um, now's a good time to review your current plan or if you haven't got a farm biosecurity plan to create one. It's important to consider the pathways um, for disease to enter your farm and what measures you can put in place to, to um, prevent that disease coming onto your farm. So if we're talking about foot and mouth disease, and lumpy skin disease specifically, um, you know, it's, you might want to consider um, where animals have come from and if, the, if you need to quarantine them. Asking people if they've been overseas recently or if they've visited other farms. Um, if someone's been overseas to a country with foot and mouth disease, um, you might ask them not to come onto your property at all. If you have visitors, contractors or agents coming in a vehicle, you might ask them to leave their vehicle at the house or on the road and travel in your car through the property. Um, there are some decontamination guides available, um, but it, uh, some, of the, some of the important key factors are making sure you remove um, any mud from, from boots and clothes, having clean clothes and boots, <clears throat> use soaps and disinfectants, uh, give everything a good, a good clean with a scrubbing brush um, and, and uh, check the labels for disinfectants. Um, going to the farm by security website, which is listed down the bottom there, um, you can get a more comprehensive process and there are some good decontamination guides available through there as well that are with practical on-farm tips. Some people might wish to implement um, a biosecurity management plan. So that's um, reasonably new legislation in 2019. It was introduced into New South Wales. Basically, if you have a plan that meets the requirements, and they're listed on the DPI website. It includes approved, approved signage. Uh, you have extra protection against unauthorised entry onto your farm. So um, people that come onto your farm and don't follow your farm biosecurity management plan, they may get a thousand dollar on the spot fine. But there's also a, um, a fine listed a court order of two hundred and twenty thousand dollars for individuals and four hundred and forty thousand for corporations. And finally, I just wanted to quickly talk through what might happen with an emergency animal disease investigation. So our district vets uh, in, in local land services are out there doing these on farms every day. Um, and, and basically, if someone's got a disease in their livestock that they're not sure about, they might call a private vet or they might call a district vet. I'm just going to go through the process now of what happens if they would call a, a district vet. Um, so basically the um, district vet visits the farm and does an investigation. Our, our vets are well trained in um, recognising some of the common livestock diseases and some of the most important ones. They'll collect samples and send them to the laboratory, the laboratory if necessary. Um, testing for EADs might be included and also testing for other possible diseases. And then the owner will get advice back on uh, what the final diagnosis is. So we'll, the, the district vet will let them know if they've if excluded um, certain exotic diseases, for example, but also what the final diagnosis is. And a key here is if you've got unwell stock, get them investigated on farm by a district vet. Don't send them to the sale yards. We don't want potential lumpy skin disease or foot and mouth disease cases at sale yards. And that's it for me, Pip. Scott, very interesting. Next up, we have our last speaker, our Local Land Services Senior Biosecurity Officer, Mick Elliott. And I believe Mick's going to touch on that very important issue of feral animals, including pigs. Um, Thank Mick you. Is the, he's the Senior Biosecurity Officer. He's worked with the North Coast Local Land Services for eight years, assisting landholders with pest animal control. And he's played a significant role in the control of feral deer and horses across the North Coast and is highly experienced trapping and baiting feral animals. 
So Mick, I might send you all the landline viewers complaints about feral horses to you. Thank you. <laughs> um, prior to that, he spent 10 years in the Pilbara working with the Department of Ag controlling pest animals, including wild dogs, feral donkeys, wild horses, and was a team member in the WA section of the National Feral Camel Reduction Program. Yeah, so I'm just going to run through some of the challenges uh, around these introduced disease uh, diseases in regard to pest animal management and the importance of uh, reporting these pests. Um, some, are, some feral animals uh, will be considered vectors uh, in, you know, in the, um, for the spread of introduced disease, like foot and mouth, if they were to get in. And uh, the movement of these ferals will allow the disease to spread quite quickly. Um, so livestock producers should ensure measures are in place as far as possible to prevent feral animals from coming into contact with their stock and also having and or uh, having a uh, and or being part of a feral animal control plan will greatly help that. Um, part of a, a, a control plan will be of great assistance, probably the best assistance that we can actually we can actually involve ourselves in because that's telling us what's going on in and around us and gives us, um, allows us to pick the techniques for control that will suit a particular person or area. Um, we, do, we look at that slide there with feral pigs and important to remember that for any sort of um, population reduction with feral pigs, we need to aim for 80% control of that population to ensure that we've got a downward trend. Um, and you can imagine that, that the sooner you get on when the population is low, the, the better chance you have of controlling that, um, that um, um, infestation. I'll just move to the second slide. So um, given um, the seasons that we've been seeing in most of, um, certainly New South Wales at the minute, um, Peak population, feral peak populations have spread very quickly and into many areas that we've never seen them in before. Um, not only in so not only in pastoral type areas, but also horticultural holdings like um, uh, macadamias have, have seen feral peaks moving through, and um, um, that gives them access to lots of different holdings. Although you might have um, you might have uh, um, stock on your holding and there's a macadamia place next door, the, the fact that the feral pigs can move through both of those quite easily uh, means that any spread can happen quite quickly. Uh, feral pigs are capable of having uh, a number of litters a year. So obviously their population will, will explode. So again, the importance of establishing control when numbers are reasonably low gives the best chance of, of success. So just the next slide. Um, feral deer, another another pest animal that uh, has exploded recently in New South Wales. Um, and I know up onto the north coast here, we are seeing them pop up into areas that is surprising us almost daily. Um, it's recognised as the fastest growing pest animal we have in New South Wales. And um, they compete with livestock for, for grazing resources, have a uh, can have a range of environmental impacts um, and uh, not only as far as pastoral, as far as water quality reduction, but also browsing and trampling of vegetation, um, including threatened native uh, vegetation. And of course, um, will be seen as a vector of foot and mouth. So what can we do about it? If we move to the next slide, um, the, uh, the management of, of all of these feral animals is, is, is dependent upon landholders um, discussing with each other, forming those plans, as we said, and LLS can, can assist in these sorts of things. We've got to remember that it's not possible to eradicate all pest animals. It's just not going to happen. What we have to aim for is reduce numbers, keep those numbers low, um, and this sort of thing is assisted by pest animal control plans. Um, a pest animal control plan on, on all places would aim for cross tenure control. So that drags in all land managers, um, working with them using all available techniques. So um, part of the challenges is that in that, um, certainly on the North Coast is uh, absentee landholders. 
and the, uh, they might need to be aware that they have pest animals on their holdings. So this is where a local plan can really assist. Um, it can identify the areas where pest animals are and may be accessing absentee landholders' uh, properties. And efforts can then be made to identify, and to identify these landholders and then and get them involved in a plan or, or allow access for control. Um, your local biosecurity officers can um, and will assist in the development of a plan, um, will give advice on, on the control techniques that, that, that can be used and provide the relevant training. Um, and in the case of, in many cases, supply an appropriate poison bait. And just a final slide there. Reporting is, is one of the major, um, major uh, things that we would like to push out to people. If we don't know they're there, then we can't assist. Um, certainly, we rely on your reports of pest animals to assist us in the development of control options in different areas. And with most pest animals, the available control techniques are always going to revolve around trapping, shooting, and the use of, where, where possible, poison baits. Um, in the case of um, feral pigs, for, for instance, a uh, relatively new bait, uh, hog on, has proven successful in, in lots of areas, specifically targets feral pigs, and can be used as a technique as well as the others um, to assist in dropping those populations. Um, group programs have proven very successful with, with um, products like hog on, um, and this comes from reporting of those pest animals so that we can involve um, a landholders in and around the ones that have or have reported those those um, those pests. Um, reporting pest animals helps us to plot things like numbers, their movement, expansion, um, and indeed where where um, can assist in the allocation of resources in in the event of an outbreak. Uh, you can report report pest animal sightings to your local LLS office or via a feral scan. And uh, Feral Scan is a really handy community-based reporting system, an app that can be can downloaded on your phone. Important to remember um, all of the information on that is private and um, you can that, that can be shared with a government agency like LLS who can assist with, uh, with control and with advice on, on where you go from there. Um, thanks, Pip. That's, that's me. Thanks, Mick. Thanks, Mick. Uh, I think I might have a feral cat or two here for you to come and sort out on your holidays. Yes. <laughs> um, that's really great, clear information, and it's pretty scary about um, the explosion of pigs um, just at a time where you don't need them all over the place and how, how much they amplify the disease. Well, we have time for some questions, and here's one that's come through which we think maybe Scott is best to answer. There have never been any cattle brought onto my property and many tags lost on the property. Why should I complete a pick reconciliation? Yeah, thanks Pip. So it sounds like this person doesn't have cattle on their property, but the NLS database might say that they do. So it really comes down to accurate information for tracing. So if we get a disease outbreak, um, and the database tells us that certain cattle are on someone's property, um, we would have to contact that person and find out where those cattle are, where they were previously, how they got there. Um, and if the information was false, it just means a lot of ringing around to find out where those cattle actually are. So by ensuring that the information for your property on the database is correct, um, it's going to save a lot of um, extra ringing around and, and trying to find the right information during an outbreak. And uh, Chris, if you could answer this one, if there is a, a, a 72 hour national livestock standstill, does that mean cattle en route to or from farms or abattoirs or feedlots? What happens to them? What happens to abattoirs? I mean, it sounds like a recipe for chaos. Do you think people understand what the implications are that if it's found in Western Australia is a national lockdown? Well, I think um, folk need to understand that the, the best way to minimise the spread of this disease is to, is to lock down the movement of stock. Um, and as soon as it's found, uh, we lock down the movement of stock. One of the reasons also for the stock standstill is it's unlikely, given experience overseas, that the first case you'll find will be the index case. So there'll be other cases around almost certainly that need to be dealt with. 
So it's not not always going to be, oh, that's where it was found is where it first came into the country. Um, so that's the, the, the major reason behind the stock standstill. There are provisions that allow the movement of stock through to the end of their journey. Um, and uh, for those stock that would be on, and I actually was over in Bendigo at the conference talking to truckers about this, and I think there's a good understanding in the industry that those animals will be moved through to their destination. There's nothing stopping animals that are in layerage in abattoirs from being slaughtered into the normal supply chain. And I would expect that that would happen, although it would be challenging, obviously, to sell the product. But at least those animals would be managed in that way. Sale yards are a little more problematic, but uh, all, the, all the big sale yards around the country certainly have plans for dealing with this sort of thing. So, Pip, there's obviously a range of, uh, you know, uh, scenarios that have played out. A lot of them have already been gamed, if you like, and a lot of them have already been thought through. Um, and I think it's important that people uh, understand that a lot of this preparatory work has already been done, but certainly as far as stock moving, yes, there's a standstill, but if you're on a truck, you go to your destination, and that's a well-understood principle. And uh, everybody can have a crack at this. Um, if landholders could, landholders could do one thing tomorrow, to help, what would it be? Do you want to go first, Elise? Yeah, I'll have a go. I think the fundamental thing for producers or anyone that has livestock is, is to one, know what the threats are. So I think that's a pretty big tick box for most people. And, and certainly the folks on this call um, obviously are, are in the know because they're here and they're wanting to know what the situation is and what, what they can do. Um, but you just need to be monitoring your stock. So the more often you look and know what is normal for you, the more likely you'll pick up something that is not normal. So I guess, um, you know, we've probably got a little bit out of the habit in some cases, you know, intensive industries, they deal with their stock and they're contained in a way that they look at them every single day. Um, so that level of monitoring is quite high. But when you're talking about extensive industries, it may be less simply because of logistics. Um, but as soon as most often and, and, and as often as you can look at them um, and be watching for those clinical signs, that's the key. And uh, what would you say, Mick? What could landholders do tomorrow? Um, report pest animals. It, it, um, it's the starting point for any sort of control and any sort of resource allocation in, in the event of an outbreak. Okay, um, Scott? Thanks, Pip. I think um, after people have done those couple of things, it's it's uh, they're very important. It's about um, talking to your neighbours, talking to everyone else that you know that has livestock, and making sure if you've got any more questions, um, you ask an expert. If if anyone's got any more questions, you know, get to know your local land services office and your district vet. Um, see if you need to pull some more information together through a workshop or something. Okay, well, it sounds like a return to old-fashioned shepherding and knowing, seeing your stock every day if you, if you can. Um, I need to let everybody know that um, basically LLS, there is no question. It's an old journo saying there is no question. That's too simple, too silly or too dumb. They want, if, if you have a question, ask it. Um, and we have another one coming in here. And if you're looking for all, more information about their biosecurity responsibilities, um, the LS, L, LLS news, the website is lls.nsw.gov.au and uh, the two important contacts to take down, keep close, keep them uh, near your in, phones in sheds and offices, have them in the car, have these numbers, that uh, the 1300 795 and the other one that I wrote down before, which is the Emergency Animal Disease Watch Hotline, 1800 675 888. And there is a question about compensation. If there's an outbreak and a landholder is impacted and quarantined, is there some government compensation in place for destroyed animals? And Liz, that's going to you. That's good. Uh, yes, so there is uh, agreed valuation and compensation structures in place. So that's the, the, the jurisdiction legislation allows for the compensation. But again, under the OSFET plan structure, we've actually had a good go at thinking about how this could be done fairly. Um, and again, just while we've got an opportunity, we're reviewing the valuation and compensation manual to make sure particularly around sheep and cattle uh, industries and goats that 
the valuation tables in there um, are actually reflective of current market prices. So uh, animals that are destroyed as a result of infection or through an order. So if, if you're one of the impacted properties um, and that is the plan that's best determined for you is, is that the animals need to go, um, those animals will be compensated for and they'll be valued prior to. The valuation is based on the market uh, levels for the two weeks prior to the response. So obviously we know we've talked about it already that our markets are gonna be pretty uh, damaged by the time we get a confirmed infection. So those market values are actually calculated on the pre-response uh, market values. Well, uh, we don't have um, any more questions. So we will share this recording and the slides with everybody who registered. So get those contacts down, make sure your family and staff can don't have to rustle through 50,000 papers in four filing cabinets to find that number. Um, good night, everybody, and, and good on you for showing up for something that is so important. Thanks, everyone.